Hey guys, it's your boy Tristan, and welcome back to another tutorial series on how to make an online MMO using Godo and Python. So in this series, I'll be teaching you how to make this. So as you can see, I have a game loaded on a website and exported to the browser. And you can also have a desktop version for Windows, Mac, and you can also have mobile versions as well. So I can come in and log in. And I get loaded into the world and I can have a chat with my friends. And then if I want my friend to join me, they can register for an account as well. They can choose their avatar and then confirm their registration and join the fun. So for this series, if you want to follow along, you can visit my blog. There'll be a link in the description, but you can also go to tbat.me. Come on over to the posts section. And here you'll start to see the blog entries for each video appear. As I upload the videos, I'll upload the corresponding reading material. And there you'll be able to copy and paste all the code without having to type it out manually. If you want as well, you can visit the official GitHub repository github.com slash Tristan Bachelor slash official Godo Python MMO. And all these links will be in the description. And this first video spends a lot of time in the beginning setting up the required framework. There'll be a lot of sort of uh, backend programming and even some front-end programming, which sets the stage up later for uh, easier development. If you do want to skip the first infrastructure setup and get straight to the actual programming of the game itself, you can come to the GitHub repository and just click on this releases button on the right hand side. And then if you scroll down, you'll find the initial template code. If you download that, then you can just extract the zip folder. And inside here, you'll find all the initial setup code that you need to get started. And I'll leave a timestamp to the part in this video that you can skip to if you do want to skip all of the uh, initial setup. Just note that if you do want to skip the initial setup, I would still recommend reading the first part of the blog, which explains how to set up a Python virtual environment and download all of the prerequisites. And I'll also be going through that in the video now. Speaking of prerequisites, uh, we're going to be using Autobahn Twisted for Python to run the server code. I find that this is a very easy to use framework that supports the WebSocket protocol, which is important for if we want to export our game to HTML5 for the web. We'll also be using Django as the database backend, which is just a very compatible library with Python and it's just very easy to get set up. And for the front end, we're just going to be using the Godo game engine which is a free and open source and very portable game engine that has a lot of very cool export features. So as I was saying, you can export for the web or for mobile and for the desktop as well. And that's all for free. So just a bit of background on this tutorial series, it's going to be split up into mainly two sections. So we're gonna have the short-term goal and then the long-term goal. So the short-term goal will be to get a very, very robust chat room working so people can register for a user and then log in and then chat with their friends. So that will be the short term goal that requires setting up all of the architecture and then all of the infrastructure as well to make a very robust and extendable framework for making our game. And then finally, the long term goal will be actually creating the game on top of that so people can choose an avatar when they register and then they can move around and you can see other players moving around and there'll be graphics and then we'll finish up with some closing remarks and some ideas for how you could extend your this this sort of demo so first things first uh, you're going to need python and if you're running mac or linux you probably don't you probably already have a recent version of Python 3, but if you're running Windows, then you can just come onto python.org slash downloads, and then just click this download button. Next, you'll want to get Visual Studio Code, which is a very good text editor, uh, but it has a lot of features, um, especially good for Python programming. 
So you can come to code.visualstudio.com slash download and just install as you normally would for your operating system. So once you have all of that set up, just come into your computer and make a folder any way you like. And this will be our main project folder. So I'm just going to call this one MMO. And now let's just open up Visual Studio Code. And then you can come into open folder and then navigate to your project folder that you've just created and then click select folder. And it'll ask you if you want to trust the authors. Well, we are the authors, so yes. So now we have our empty folder. So now we're going to create a subfolder. So you can come up here to the top left and click new folder. And then we'll call this server. Right click on your server folder and click open an integrated terminal. And this will open up a terminal box down here in the bottom section. And we're going to run a few commands. So we're setting up the virtual environment, which makes it easier to manage all of our dependencies for our pre-required packages. So the first command we'll run on our server folder is python-m venv, venv. And what this does is sets up a virtual environment inside a folder called venv. Next, we have to activate the virtual environment. On Windows, you can type this command. So venv scripts activate. And then you'll see a green venv prompt at the beginning of your terminal. If you're on Mac or Linux, the, com the, c the same command will be venv bin activate. So you'll just replace the scripts with bin. So now that we've activated our virtual environment, we can start to install our prerequisites. So the first one will run pip install autobahn twisted. So once that's done, the next prerequisite we need is Django for the database. And now that we have our virtual environment set up, there's just a couple more things we want to do before we start getting our hands dirty and writing our own code. The first thing that I would highly recommend is clicking this extensions button here on the left and then search for Python. And you're going to want to install the first one that's just called Python and it will have the most downloads as well. This will install a few extensions for you. Namely, you want this uh, IntelliSense for Python and then you also want the language server. Once you install that extension, it may take a while, but once you do install it, we just want to tell VS Code where our virtual environment is so that it won't complain if we try to import packages that we don't have in our base installation of Python. So just come down here to the bottom left where it says Python and then just click enter interpreter path. And then we're just going to click find, come into our project folder, server, venv, and then if you're on Windows, you'll go to scripts. And if you're on Mac or Linux, you'll go to bin. And then just find Python and then select interpreter. And then you should see down the bottom left here, it says venv. So if you would like to skip the rest of setting up the infrastructure code manually, uh, you can skip to that uh, part in the timestamp that I will link to in the video and you can just go to the GitHub repository and download the release like I talked about before. When you extract the folder, you can just merge it into this server folder and you should get um, a client folder and then you'll have your server folder with your virtual environment. And you'll also have this .vs code folder, which contains your preferred Python path. For those of you who stuck around, uh, we're going to get our hands dirty now writing our own infrastructure code. Um, but by no means should you be expected to understand the sort of more advanced level of Python that we're going to be using here. So inside the server folder, just right click on server and then click new file. And we're going to call this packet.py. Inside this file, we're going to provide a way to construct and deconstruct packets that will be sent and received via the network. So in case you don't know, a packet is just a piece of information that gets sent from one computer to another over a network. So for example, if I wanted to send a message to someone on my game, I would send a chat packet and 
this packet is got sort of an action, which is the chat. And then it's also got payloads, which would be the message that I want to send. So the reason we might want a class for this is so that we can easily construct them. And then we can also easily turn them into bytes so that then we can send them over the network. And we also want a way of converting bytes back into a packet so that we can interpret them elsewhere in our code. So we're going to want to input JSON and enum. And then next we'll define our enum, which is called action. So this is where we're going to store all the types of packets that we need. Next, we're defining the class packet, the base class. And in the constructor, we're going to pass in an action, which is a member of this enum. And we're also going to pass in some number of payloads, which is going to be the data for our packet. We're also going to define the to string function. So we start with the almost empty dictionary. It just contains a key for A corresponding to the name of the action that this packet is. And then we just loop through all of the payloads and we assign keys to our dictionary, P0, P1, P2. And these will correspond to the first, second and third payloads in this packet. And then finally, we just use the JSON library to dump a string of our dictionary. And then we just return that string. So the reason we've defined the string method is so that we can use it here. So when we want to convert our packet to bytes, we simply turn it into a string and then we encode it using UTF-8. And that will enable us to send it over the network quite easily. So we have a way of going from a packet to a string, but we also just, we would like to be able to do the reverse of that. So this function here from JSON, we take in a string and it returns a packet. So we start by loading in the string as a dictionary. And then using this dictionary, we can loop through all of the keys and values, which will correspond to either actions or payloads. If it is an action, then we'll store it, the action in this variable here. And then if it's one of our payloads, then we'll shove it into a payloads array. So this is where it gets kind of neat. Um, so what we'll be doing when we create new types of packets is we'll be creating subclasses of this base packet class. And we're always going to call the packet the name of the action and then the word packet at the end. So for example, I might want to make a class called chat packet, which subclasses this packet base class. So I would call it the name of the action, which would be chat and then the word packet. So that will be my convention for creating new packets. And that will play quite nicely with what we do here. So in order to go from a dictionary to a packet, we first need to determine what the class name is so that we can get the actual specific type of packet that we're trying to reconstruct. So we, as before, we, we call it the action plus the word packet. And then we just try getting a constructor for that type using some dynamic programming. And then we try to return an instance of this subclass. And then we just have some error handling. So that's it for our packet class. We can save this file and then we're going to create a new one. So right click on server, new file, and we're going to call this one protocol.py. So we're going to need Python's Q library. And then we're also going to import the packet class that we just wrote. And then finally, we'll need a WebSocket protocol class from Autobahn. So we'll start defining a new class called game server protocol, which will be a subclass of the WebSocket protocol. So this will be the main. So this will be the main thing that is going to be communicating between us and our client. And we can also use this class to communicate to other protocols that will also be on the server, but we'll get to that later. For now, we're just going to construct this class. So we'll just call the parent classes constructor, and then we'll go ahead and initialize a packet queue. So this will be a queue that processes all of our packets that we receive in order. So as you can see, it's going to contain a tuple of another game server protocol and a packet. 
So this will be the sender and then this will be what they're sending. And then this will go into our queue and get processed every tick. We're also going to define what's called our protocol's state. So this will be sort of a function that we can call every tick. And our state functions will be responsible for processing these packets from the queue. Speaking of which, our first state will be called play. And in the future, we can have other states like a login state. And the power of using states to process packets is depending on what state you're in, you don't need to listen for certain types of packets coming in and you can just ignore them. And also different states can process the same packet in different ways, depending on context. So this is why we will be using states. So you can see each state will take a sender, which is another protocol and a packet that you want to process. But for now, we're just going to pass on defining this state. We're gonna create a tick function which every protocol will have. And what it does is it just checks to see if the packet queue is empty. It'll get the sender and the packet from the queue, and then it will call our state function with that, with those parameters. So this is kind of the heartbeat of our protocol. It gets triggered by the factory, which we'll create in a minute, but basically every single protocol in the server will be ticking at the same rate and processing their individual packet queues and commuting back, communicating back to their clients. So that being said, we need a way to communicate packets between protocols. So if my protocol wants to talk to your protocol and say, Tristan said hello, it will send a chat packet to your protocol so that you can process it in your state function. So here we just have a broadcast function that takes a, a packet that you want to broadcast and then it will send it to everyone on the server by default but if you want to exclude sending it to yourself which you will want to do in some cases then you can use this optional parameter here so we just loop through all of the other protocols in the factory we skip ourselves if we come to it um, but apart from that we just we 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 make them uh, process this packet so speaking of that on packet function that you see here uh, this is the definition for that. So it's just a function that takes in a sender, which is a protocol, and then a packet, and it just puts it in the queue. It's pretty simple. We've also got to add a few boring override functions where all I'm doing is just having some sort of debug statements. So these functions all come from the uh, WebSocket server protocol class that we're inheriting from but we're also just going to be doing some logging. So when we connect to the server, we're just gonna say client connecting. And then when the WebSocket connection opens, we'll just make a print statement, but we're also gonna set our state to the play state. And finally, this override here is when we get disconnected from the, from the WebSocket. This override is a little bit more interesting. This is our on message override. So this gets fired when the protocol receives some bytes over the network. So what we do here is we just, we decode the payload that was sent um, as UTF-8. And then we just try to construct a packet out of it using our handy from JSON function that we defined. And if we couldn't construct the packet, then we just print an error. Then what we do is we call our on packet function that we've defined ourselves up here. So every time we receive a message, we want to try to convert it to a packet because that's what we sort of expect. And then we just sort of process that, add it to our queue. And last but not least, we'll just want to have some functionality for sending a packet directly to our client without, um, without broadcasting it to other protocols. So that's how we do that here. So I know it's a lot of code, um, especially to start out with, and it's maybe quite boring to just see all of this code without uh, really seeing what it's doing yet. Uh, but yeah, this is kind of the design of this project is to make uh, a very robust framework to start out with. And you don't really need to know all of the details uh, if you do want to skip to uh, sort of uh, the, the middle of this uh, video, you can download the, the template code. Uh, but yeah, we, we do really want this code to be a good foundation for which we can build, uh, we can easily build new features on top of once we start making our game. 
So now that we have our packet and our protocol, we can finally make the main server class. So we'll create a new file inside the server folder called underscore underscore main underscore underscore dot pi. So this will be the entry point for our server program. So we're just going to be importing a few things that we'll need. Uh, we'll need our protocol uh, that we just, we'll need our protocol file that we've just coded up. And then we'll also import some logging features, uh, some other features from uh, our web server, and then obviously our uh, web socket server factory as well. So we're going to create a class, uh, what's going to be called our game factory. So this is our web socket server factory subclass. And in the constructor, we pass in a host name and a port, and then we just connect to it. So we use web sockets, ws colon slash slash, and then the host name and then the port number. We're also defining a set of all of our players. So these are all of our game server protocols. Uh, and this is just an empty set to begin with. We'll also do sort of the heart of the server, which is the tick loop. And this is a, a looping call, which means that every so often uh, it will call a function in this class. So we haven't defined this function yet, but it's called self.tick and we're making we're starting off this tick loop by making it go uh, once every 1 20th of a second. So in other words, uh, every every second uh, we'll call this tick function 20 times. And you might be able to guess the tick function just in turn uh, calls the tick function for all of our protocols. And uh, this is a game factory. So every time someone connects to it, we're going to build a new protocol. And this will just build a, uh, a new WebSockets protocol. And we're just gonna add it to our set of players. And finally, the official entry point for the server, um, we're gonna start logging. And we're gonna define our port to be 8081, which is a pretty safe port uh, to run a game from. Uh, but you can choose a port that, that you would like to use as long as it's open on your computer and not being used by some other common program. And we're going to also initialize our factory to be listening on um, all IP addresses and on our port 8081. And then we just start the server. So that's it for the server code for now. So we can save all this. And now we're going to start getting some infrastructure set up on the Godot side of things. So if you haven't already, uh, you can just come into godoengine.org slash downloads and it'll take you to the page for the operating system you're on. So you'll just click this download button for the standard version. Make sure you get the standard version, not the C-sharp version. Once you download Godot, you'll just get this zip folder. Um, it's about 38 megabytes, so it's very small for a game engine. And you can just extract the zip, and then you'll just get a single executable inside. So this is what you'll actually open up to start the game engine. So you can just double click, and then just click cancel when it asks you if you want to explore some example projects. We're going to create a new project, but just quickly, if you did skip ahead and you already have the project downloaded, you can come here and click import and then just navigate to where you extracted the code and merged it in with your virtual environment. And you'll just come into it and um, open the client folder. And inside there should be a project.goto file. So you can open that. But if you're going through it with me from scratch, uh, we're going to click new project, call it client, and then just navigate to your project folder. Click create folder, and then create and edit. So our project folder should now look like this. We have a client folder and a server folder. And inside the server folder, we have our virtual environment and we have these three files. And if you have a PyCache folder, don't worry about that. So within the Godot editor, uh, we'll just stick to the 2D for now. So make sure that 2D is clicked. And the other thing that we'll be using is that script. So you can click script up here. So usually if you need to get from one thing to another, you can just click these buttons at the top. But for now, yeah, we're going to create a new script. So down here in the bottom left is the file system. So you can right click on this res folder and click new script. And we're going to call this one packet 
index.gd and click create. So now if you double click on packet.gd and you can delete this code that gets generated by default. And basically inside this script, we are going to define essentially the packet class, similar to how we did it in Python. So Goto works a little bit differently. So we're gonna start by saying extends object, which just means that we're creating a very generic sort of class. We're gonna define our class variables. So we have uh, action, which is a string. So that this will be like chat and login. And then we've got the payloads array as well. So this is the constructor for our class. We take in an action and a list of payloads, and then we just set our class variables accordingly. And then we have our toString function. Again, very similar to Python. Uh, we create a dictionary with just the, the key A and then our action name. And then we loop through all of the payloads and insert them accordingly, uh, p0, p1, etc. And then we just uh, convert the whole thing to a string and, uh, and then return that. So it's very, very similar to the Python way of doing things. And then finally, we need a way to uh, go from a string back to a packet. So that's what this function here is for. It's very similar to the Python way of doing things. We just create a dictionary out of the string, and then we loop through all of the keys and values of the dictionary. If we come across a key that is just like the letter A, then we, we let that be our action. And then for all of the payloads, uh, we, we insert into our payloads array. And then we just return a list of the action and the payloads. So if we try to save the script uh, with Control S, we'll get an error saying that the current scene has no root node but that's okay, we can just ignore that message for now. So now uh, we're going to create another script. So we just right click on our res in our file system again and click new script. And we're going to call this one websockets client.gd. Well, I'm not going to explain this one too much. There's quite a lot of stuff in here, but sort of the main key points is that we are creating sort of an API for connecting to a WebSocket server, sending a packet. We have what's called signals in Godo, and a signal is something that you can emit, and any other object in the game can try to listen to these signals and do something if it catches one. So we're just emitting some signals on, on various things um, so that other objects in our game can pick up on these if they like. So yeah, this is just an API really. Uh, the details aren't too exciting. And again, if you are watching it on the website, you can just download from the GitHub or you can copy this code. So now it's almost time for us to wrap things up. We're actually going to come into this 2D view here and we're going to create a new scene. So we're gonna create a new root node of a 2D scene. And then we're just going to right click node 2D and then rename it to main. Now we're also going to right click on this main node and then click attach script and it will name it for us main.gd so we can just click create. So we'll just get rid of this code by default and this is the code that we're going to use for our main script. So this will be kind of the heart of the client. So we're just making a reference to our network client so that we can use its functions and likewise for our packet class. We're also uh, just making an instance of our network client. Uh, so this is the thing that we'll actually call all of, all of our functions on. And then we're also defining our state because we're also gonna use a state machine on the client as well. And we're doing it very similarly to how we did it in our servers protocol.py. Our state is going to be a function and we're going to have that function get called depending on what state we're in. So now we're going to define our ready function, which is a special built-in function in Godo, which gets called once all of our references have been instantiated and loaded and all that kind of thing. So once we're ready, uh, we're just connecting um, a bunch of signals from our network client to some functions that we're going to define in this main.gd file. So for example, uh, when our network client gets connected, 
we're going to call a function called handle client connected. And then likewise for all of these ones as well. After that, uh, still in the ready function, we're going to uh, add the network client to our scene tree and we're going to connect to our server. So if you're running on your local machine, which you probably will be, uh, you'll want to put 127.0.0.1 for the host name of the server. If you customized your port from 8081 on the server side of things, you'll want to use the same number here. Uh, but if you're just following along, then the port is 8081. And then finally, we are setting our state to the play function. So for the moment, our play function or our play state will just be empty, uh, but it does take in a packet as well as an argument. So we'll fill that one out later. But let's get all of our handlers defined as well. So these are just these functions. Uh, so anytime that our network client emits a signal, uh, it'll be handled by one of these functions. So this is all pretty standard stuff. Uh, this is just sort of a print statement when we get connected. And then, you know, we have some, uh, some cleaning up um, if we get disconnected. Uh, this one is for actually handling data. So this one's probably the, the most interesting one. Um, so when we receive data from the network client, we try to convert it to a packet um, using the action and the payloads. And then we call our state function. So if we are in the play state, then we'll pass our packet into our play function. And the play function can handle that packet however it wants. And then likewise, if we're in like a login state, then uh, it'll process the packet in its own way as well. So now we're actually finished. Um, so we can try to save this main.gd script and because it's attached to a scene, it'll ask us to save scene as and just choose main.tscn. So yeah, now is probably a good idea to test it out. Um, we can try to run the server and see if we can at least connect to it, even though it won't do anything yet. So come back to Visual Studio Code, and we're just going to run uh, Python space dot. And we can see that our server is started up with no errors. So then we can also just come and click the, on this play button in Godot. And you'll see the first time you try to play your game, it'll ask you to define a main scene. So we'll just click select current because that's the only scene that we have. That's our main scene. And you'll see if you if you didn't get any errors, you hopefully see just a gray blank box for a window. But if you look at the output window of Godot, you'll notice it says connected with protocol and client connected to server. So that's very good if you do see that. And if you do look at the server output as well, you'll notice it says, you know, client connecting and then WebSocket connection open. So hopefully you'll see no errors. Um, again, if you get any errors, I definitely recommend looking inside this um, server uh, server log. And then you can also look into the uh, output um, at the bottom of the Godot window. And there's also a debugger folder as well, where there's an errors tab. So you'll probably see a bunch of uh, warnings, but it, as long as you don't see any errors, um, you should be all right. And if you still can't figure out uh, why you're getting a certain error, you can always visit the Discord or you can send me a an email or you can also leave a comment on this video and of course you can also download the code uh, from the github repository if you go to the releases section so now that we have uh, basically all of the infrastructure set up just close this uh, python server now that we have all of the infrastructure set up uh, we can actually start trying to go for our first short-term goal which will be to set up a simple chat room so for those of you that downloaded the code at the beginning of the lesson to get all of this infrastructure out of the way, uh, you can begin the lesson from this point on. Uh, we're just going to create a simple chat room. You can connect to the server and uh, you can start chatting to anyone else who's also connected. So now that we're ready to start creating our own game, we're going to create our first new packet so you guys can see what the process is like for adding content to your MMO. So usually when you create, when you need to 
uh, pass some new information uh, between protocols or from the client to the server, you need to, you need to design a packet that will store that information. So we're going to create a packet called chat. So the first thing you do is you come to this action enumerator and you create, create a new action name. So I'll type chat equals enum dot order. And what this enum dot order does is it's just a quick way to uh, keep tr automatically keep track of all of our actions. So each one of these will actually be a number. Um, but this is a very neat way of keeping track of all of our actions by keeping it in this enumerator. So the next step in creating a new packet is you need to create a subclass of our base packet class. So we'll type class chat packet. And in the parentheses, we put the packet to signify that we're creating a subclass of this main class. And the name of your packet will always be the name of your action and then the word packet. That's how we need it to work so that uh, we can reconstruct uh, packets from a JSON string. So once you have the name of your class, we create the constructor. So def init self. And then any payloads that you want to include. So for us, we're just going to have one payload called message. And it's going to be of type string. And then this constructor will simply just call the constructor of the base class. And we're passing in our action, action.chat, and we're passing in our payload. And that's it. This is how you, this is how easy it is to create a new packet uh, with this infrastructure that we're working with. So let's go back to Godo and create a scene for the chat box. Once we have the scene uh, scripted up as well, we can start sending chat packets to the server and we can then tell protocol.py how to handle those packets. So yeah, let's make a new scene. So we'll come up to scene in the top left and then new scene. And we're going to make it a user interface node for the root. And we're going to rename this scene to chat box. And we're going to create a child node of type canvas layer. And a canvas layer is very good for doing anything UI related because it is a good way to keep everything responsive to the size of the screen. So underneath the canvas layer, we're going to add a VBox container. And the VBox container just keeps everything stacked on top of each other. So the first row of our VBox container is going to be a rich text label. So this will actually be the chat log. And then the next layer of our VBox container will be a HBox container. And this HBox container will just have a label next to a line edit node. So this is what the scene tree should look like. And if I click on this 2D to get out of the script view, I can see that everything is sort of clumped onto, onto each other. And by the way, I'm uh, dragging around this view using my middle mouse button, and I can zoom in with the scroll wheel. So we don't want everything clumped on together. We want it to look like a proper chat, chat room, chat box thing. So what we're going to want to do is start with the line edit node selected and then come to the to the right hand side properties inspector and then just expand size flags and then click horizontal expand so let's do the same thing for the rich text label node but this time we'll also click vertical expand as well now let's click on our vbox container and we're going to come on over to anchor and we're going to set top to be 0 0.67 so that it sort of occupies the, the last third of the vertical space. And then we're going to set right to one and then we'll set bottom to one and then come on over to the margin 
and just reset the right and bottom to zero again so that we can see that this faint blue line is our screen. Then we can see that the line edit is sort of at, at the very bottom of our screen. And if we click on our label and just put a prompt in this text field, sort of like this, then we can sort of see everything resizes appropriately. And we can also see that our rich text label is just all of this. So when eventually there is some stuff logged to the chat, it will just go down like this. And then we also want to make it so that once the rich text label fills up, we want it to start scrolling. So we'll ensure that scroll active is enabled, but we'll also make scroll following enabled. So eventually when it fills up, you'll notice the scroll bar and it automatically scrolls for you. But if you do want to go back uh, through the history, you can scroll up using the scroll bar. So we'll save this scene as chatbox.tscn. Click save. And now we're just going to create a script for our chat box. So we can right click the, the, the root node and click attach script and just leave the path as default chatbox.gd. And then we're just gonna get rid of most of this, uh, but just leave the extends control so that we can use uh, some of the uh, UI functions if we need them. And then we're just going to bring in a couple references to nodes from our scene tree that uh, we need to use. So we've got a reference to our chat log, which is our rich text label. And then we've got a reference to our input field as well, which is the line edit node that we've got in our scene tree. We're also going to define a signal that we're going to, to emit um, called message sent, and it's going to have a parameter as a, a string message. So once the user uh, wants to send their message, it'll emit a signal for our main script to pick up on. So in our ready function, we're just gonna connect the text entered signal from our input field to a text entered function uh, in this script. So that text entered function will look like this. So it's just saying if we type something uh, into the input field, then just reset it to be blank and then we'll emit our message sent signal with the text of that, uh, with with the text of that line edit. So we're just gonna do some uh, user experience type stuff. Um, so in our input function, which is another built-in function, uh, we 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 check uh, to make sure that if we press enter, it will focus our input field, and if we press escape, then it'll just uh, unfocus the input field. And last but not least. Uh, we're just going to add a sort of API function uh, so that our main script can add a message to our chat log. So we're just taking our rich text label uh, reference and we're just adding um, the text that we want to add and then a new line. So we're done with our uh, chat box for now. So we can close our chat box script, our chat box scene rather. And so coming back to our main scene, um, I've got the main scene selected and it's just empty at the moment. Um, but what you can do is you can instance the chat box inside the main scene. So I'm just going to click and drag my chatbox.tscn from the file system into the scene tree, just on top of this main root node. And now you can see that we've instanced our chatbox scene inside of our main scene. So now what we can do with that is if we open up our main.gd script, we can make a, a reference to our chatbox by getting the node called chatbox. In the ready function, we're going to uh, connect the message sent signal from our chatbox to a function in our main script called send chat. So this function it takes uh, the text of the chat box when we uh, sent our message and it constructs a chat packet with the text as payloads. And then it uses our network client to send that packet to the server. And then it uses the chat box add message function to add that to our log. So we can save that. Uh, that's it for the front end so far. 
And now we just have a little bit more work to do on the back end before we're ready to test our chat box. So open up Visual Studio Code again. And we're going to go to protocol.py and we're going to fill out our play state function. So we can see here, we're checking if the payloads action is of the type chat, then we, we check if the sender is our own protocol, then we just broadcast our chat to everyone else, excluding ourselves. So basically, if this chat packet came from our own client, we want to tell every other protocol about it so that they can tell their client, but we don't need to tell our client again. If it came from someone else, then we just tell our client directly about this packet. So we send it straight to Godo, essentially. So that's, that's actually all we need to do to process chat packets from the protocol side of things. So remember that this function gets called every tick and then we pop the next available packet off of our queue and we'll process it. So uh, we actually need to go back to Godo for one more thing. Obviously we need to fill out our play state um, in Godo as well in, in our main.gd script. So we'll do something very similar. Uh, in Godo, we have a match statement, which is similar to a switch statement in other programming languages. Um, but it's also similar to just a chain of if elifs in Python. And um, I'm getting an error about mixed tabs and spaces. Um, so if you guys get this error, um, you can just come up to here and click editor and then editor settings, and then just scroll down to text editor and then choose the indent tab and just change the type from tabs to spaces. And then you can close this window. And then we can see that the error has gone away. So as I was saying, um, in our play state, uh, if the packets action was a chat action, then we just extract the, uh, the first payload, which is we know will be a message uh, string. And then we just uh, tell the chat box to add that message to the log. And that's it. So at this point, we can save everything. And we can, uh, we can start the server. So remember, you can just type Python dot and then enter. And then we can also just start the game in Godot. So we can see that we've got our chat box down here. And it also says client connected to server. We don't have any errors in the log for the server. So we can start to type something. So we press enter to send. And we can see that it's been logged in our chat log. We can see uh, from our Godo output that it says sent string action is chat. And then our first payload is a message that says hello. And if we look at our server output, we also see we've queued a packet, um, the same packet. Admittedly, it's not uh, completely confirmed that this is working until we get another game window going. Uh, but you'll notice that you can't click uh, the play button more than once um, with Godo. So I'm just going to close this. And then I found that it's best to um, export the game to HTML5. And then that'll unlock another button that you can click, uh, which will launch a browser window. And you can have as many of those tabs as you want uh, playing your game. So just click project and then export. Under presets, you can click add HTML5 and then manage export templates. Choose best available mirror and download and install. And then this will just install the template for exporting a HTML5 game. So once you've installed the template for HTML5 exports, just come back to project and then export again. And then you'll see this new preset called HTML5 runnable. So we'll just select that and then just click export project. We'll probably make a new folder. I'll just call it HTML5. Okay. And then we can just click save. So now we've exported our project. 
So now we can just click this little five button and click run in browser. It'll open up a browser window and then load into your game. And you can use the chat feature from your browser. We can also run the desktop app with the same play button as before. So we can just get both windows side by side and then see if the chat is really working or not. So I'll type hello. We can see it comes onto this screen as well. Type hi there. So you can see that these two clients are now having a conversation with the new chat room that we've just created the first version of. So that pretty much wraps up this video. Uh, just to summarize, we've done a lot of things, a lot of infrastructure set up. Um, we've created a very robust framework for sending WebSocket packets uh, designed for a, an MMO game. And this will make it a lot easier to get through the next parts of this series. Uh, we've used our we've used our new framework to create a sort of simple chat room, which we can keep this version of the chat room because this will eventually go into the final game. And that being said, um, if you had any errors or if you needed any help at all, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Uh, I'd love any questions or feedback you can leave on the YouTube comments. You can email me. Uh, you can join the Discord. So if you scroll down to the bottom of the blog page, you'll find all of these methods of getting in touch. And these will these will also be in the, the video description. And then please join the Discord. Uh, we don't have anyone in it yet, obviously, but uh, hopefully a few of you guys join and you can discuss uh, the, the lessons, ask for help. Uh, there'll be some homework in the future that you can discuss. And uh, generally, we just try to have a good time and help each other out. So thanks very much for watching. I really appreciate you watching to the end. Please give the video a like and consider subscribing if you would like to come along for the ride. And yeah, I'll see you in the next part, which will be very soon. Take care.